good evening. Uh, welcome. Um, this is such a special occasion, really, and uh, I'm delighted to have you all here. Thank you for coming. We have two remar remarkable individuals in our midst, um, Annie Sagan and John Shear. Um, it's, it's, it's such an honor to have you here. Before I tell you more about our guests, um, a few words about tonight's program. So the panel was organized in conjunction with the exhibition Charlotte Brooks at Look, 1951 to 1971. Um, I hope you were all able to see it. If not, come back, it's worth it. Um, planning this exhibition has been quite the journey. Um, one that started with a generous gift of prints by Charlotte Brooks um, on behalf of Catherine Hall Page, who was a uh, class of 60, 69, and uh, her sister Anne, so thank you very much. Uh, I, mu I must thank my colleagues at the Davis Museum for all their help and support. Um, everybody, and I mean everybody, contributed to making this show a thing of beauty. Um, I should especially thank our director, Lisa Fishman, and senior creator, Claire Whitner, as well as her predecessor, Eve Strassman Planser, for entrusting me with this project and for their support during the past two and a half years um, since I began my fellowship at the Davis. So with that in mind, I wish to also thank Linda Wyatt Gruber for her generous endowment of this position. It's really a rarity in our field um, and I have benefited from it tremendously. Um, there are so many people to thank, uh, wonderful faculty, students, but I want to thank especially Felice, Felice Smith, who is here tonight. And uh, she worked with me on the exhibition over the summer and has contributed to our catalog, which I have here. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, please take a look. Um, the team at Stoltz Design, who I also wish to thank for the craft they have brought to the making of this catalog, and Lucy Flint, who is here, Beverly Brennan, Vicki Goldberg, they've contributed beautiful essays. Yes, grab a copy if you haven't yet. All right. So Charlotte Brooks was a pioneer in many ways, in so many ways. She was the first woman photographer to be hired full-time by Look Magazine. Through her work, she sought to advance social justice, perhaps more subtly at first and more, more for forcefully as years passed. Um, she fought for equal pay and fair representation in the industry. The year she joined Look was 1951, and the United States was entering a period of great prosperity, but also of profound unrest. Picture magazines were incredibly popular, and the extent of their impact is hard to comprehend by today's standards, immersed as we are in visual imagery. Documentary photographers, whether working independently or commercially, witnessed and recorded these massive political, social, and cultural transformations that swept through these con this, this country and reverberated throughout the world. Now, I turn to our guests for the evening. Um, first, Annie, Annie Sagan, an oral historian, writer, editor, curator, multimedia artist. She uh, will, provide, will provide insight based on her knowledge of art and social change, she will speak about the work of her father, Arthur Rothstein, one of my favorite photographers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he was one of, the, one of the most important figures that was part of the FSA um, project, photography project run by Roy Stryker very famously during the Depression era. He, was, um, he, was, um, he worked during World War II and uh, was stationed in the Pacific. Annie will talk a little bit about that, I hope. She and um, Arthur ran the photography department at Look for many, many years, and he brought incredible talent to the magazine and really helped photographers hone their skills. So uh, I'm so excited for this. Um, after Annie's lecture, John Shearer and I will sit down and have a conversation about his work, after which I'll invite you all to participate in a conversation with us, with all of us. So, without further ado, Annie Sagan.
go. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Liliana. And I'm happy to be here in connection with. I'm stand up here. Oh, I'm so tall. Um, <laughs> uh, be here in connection to this beautiful exhibit at the at the Davis. You have to see it. I'm so impressed with it. And um, and the catalog. I don't know if you've realized that, but it looks like a Look magazine. <laughs> Brilliant job. Um, so, my father's close relationship with Charlotte Brooks and her beloved Julie Arden spanned almost 45 years, until his death in 1985. And when Dan, when Dad died, my, uh, Charlotte wrote to my mom that Arthur was the single most important influence in, his, in her photographic career. I recently found a snapshot from the 40s of Charlotte Arthur and Arthur's first wife, Diane Tendler, at the beach. I thought it was Julie at first, and then I looked at it more carefully, I realized it wasn't Julie. So today I'm going to share uh, an overview of my father's 50-year career and talk a little about how he influenced Charlotte's photographic career and give you a sense of what it was like to be the daughter of a hard-working magazine photojournalist. Well, I'm also going to share a few pictures from my family photo album at the end. So in 1935, Arthur Rothstein was a 19-year-old senior at Columbia University. And that year, at the height of the Great Depression, he was hired by former Columbia University professor Roy Stryker to help create the photo unit of the Resettlement Administration. And the Resettlement Administration was a New Deal federal agency uh, created by Franklin Roosevelt uh, and it was to assist struggling and displaced farmers and industrial workers. And in 1937, the agency became part of the Farm Security Administration, or FSA, and then five years later, in 1942, it became part of the Office of War Information. So Dan was the first photographer hired by Roy Stryker. That's him in the middle. And then Roy is over on the right. And the guy on the left is, is John Vachon, and the other guy in the middle is uh, um, Russ Lee. Russell Lee. <laughs> My mind went blank. All right, so uh, Stryker's talented photo unit eventually also included Dorothea Lang, Marion Post Walcott, Ben Sean, Walker Evans, uh, Gordon Parks, and others. It's interesting to note that one photographer who, who contributed very briefly to, uh, to the file, as it was called, was named Charlotte Park Brooks. Just a coincidence, no relation to our Charlotte. So as these photographers traveled through the country documenting the Great Depression and the FSA programs, they created an extensive record of life in the United States during the 1930s and 40s. And the pictures were distributed widely in magazines and in newspapers. Arthur made a name for himself early when Shy, just shy of his 21st birthday on assignment document, got, documenting severe drought conditions in Cimarron County, Oklahoma. He photographed a farmer named Art Coble and his two young sons just as a dust storm swooped down on the sandy soil of their desolate farm. And this image became iconic, a symbol of the Dust Bowl and of all the ecological disaster that displaced thousands of families from the Great Plains. The Great Depression caused many hundreds of thousands of Americans to migrate from one part of the country to another part of the country. And Dad and the other FSA photographers were described as, so, as sociologists with cameras. And they documented this displacement. So this guy is named Vernon Evans. And he and his family left their rain-starved, grasshopper-plagued, failed farm in North Dakota. And they were heading west looking for a better opportunity and a better life. Here's one of my favorites. Cowboys after a day's work at the, oh, cowboys singing after a day's work at the Quarter Circle U Ranch, Bighorn, Montana, 1939. 
The FSA photographers introduced America to Americans. People in the city got to see how farmers and ranchers lived. And rural folks got to see how city folks lived. This is in the Bronx, right near where my dad lived when he was a kid. In 1935, Midwestern publisher, newspaper publisher, Gardner Coles Jr., seen here on the left with his brother John, wanted to increase circulation. So Coles hired University of Iowa journalism student George Gallup, Gallup Polls, to conduct a survey. And Gallup found that readers wanted more imagery. So this data led Coles to add more pictures to his newspapers, and he began exploring the creation of a, of a picture magazine. Henry Luce published the first Life magazine in November of 1936, designed with larger pages to accommodate more photographs. And this is the first Life cover with a photograph by Margaret Burke White, another pioneering woman in photojournalism. And Life was, was dedicated to presenting the news in pictures. Three months later, in February of 1937, the Coles brothers published the first issue of Look Magazine. And Look was going to be a monthly, but it was immediately so popular that they started publishing it every other week. So this is the very first cover, and it's, uh, it's Germany's Nazi leader and General Hermann Goring bottle feeding his lion cub. <laughs> so Gardner Cole said, Look was the exciting story of people, what they think, what they want, what they do, and what they feel. And for the next 35 years, Life and Look competed fiercely. And they set a standard, a high standard for photojournalism. And the, the <coughs> decade before World War II and the two decades after World War II were known as the golden age of magazine photography. So Gardner Coles had consulted Roy Stryker about his plans for a picture magazine, and Look had a democratic, progressive slant to it, and often ran uh, and utilized the FSA photographs. During his five years on the road for the FSA, Arthur Rothstein had refined his technical and artistic abilities as a photographer, and he documented injustice and the economic hardships faced by Americans in every region of the country. In 1940, Gardner Coles moved Look Magazine to New York City from Des Moines, Iowa, and Arthur was tired of living in his car, so he happily accepted a job as staff photographer at Look Magazine in New York City, his hometown. Arthur had not lost his uh, had not lost his social his his social conscience when he left the FSA, and at Look, he continued to create social documentary stories. In addition, in addition to popular culture, Look carried in-depth feature stories on politics, international affairs, and controversial subjects like segregation and mental health and the labor movement. This, this December 1940 Look story by Arthur Rothstein highlighted the indignities of daily life suffered by a young black man living in the South. Arthur met Charlotte Brooks and Julie Arden in 1941. Charlotte and Dad had a lot in common. Charlotte was interested in photography, and they were both first-generation Americans, New Yorkers from kosher homes. As such, they were brought up with Jewish values, including the perceived obligation to look for ways to actively improve society. And Dad introduced Charlotte to renowned dance photographer Barbara Morgan. And during her internship assisting Barbara, Charlotte realized that photography was her calling, and she devoted her life to it. This picture features Julie, a dramatist, hemming it up in a veil, and Charlotte playing guitar, and Bob Dirks, Dad's handsome studio assistant at Look Magazine. During the war years, Gardner Coles took a break from publishing and to head up the domestic branch of the Office of War Information in New York City. He arranged for Dad to work there. Eventually, Dad was called up for active duty, and he served in the U.S. Army Signal Corps in India and China. Charlotte and Arthur 
exchanged correspondence throughout the war years, and Arthur used his influence with his former FSA boss, Roy Stryker, who hired Charlotte in 1945 as a photographer for a project that documented the history and operations of Standard Oil of New Jersey. Dad sent Charlotte and Julie this photograph taken with a self-timer on VE Day, May 8, 1945. The war ended, and by fall of 1946, both Coles and Dad were back at look. Both my parents had been divorced, so when they met in 1946, they knew what they wanted. Look Magazine photographer Phil Harrington took this lovely picture of them on their very first date. The publisher of Look, Gardner Coles Jr., married Fleur Fenton in 1946. Fleur was glamorous and savvy. By 1947, she was the woman's editor at Look Magazine, and a year later, she was also the associate editor at Quick. Fleur encouraged her husband to experiment with new publications. Quick was a small format magazine, four by six, and cost 10 cents. The predecessor of TV Guide Quick included current events and some headlines, but its primary purpose was to follow TV news and provide schedules of TV shows. The magazine was in circulation from 1949 through 1953, and that's me on the cover. <laughs> Fleur Coles also came up with Flair, a magazine published from 1950 to 1951, described as a bouillabaisse of vogue, town and country, and holiday. It was celebrated for its lavish and innovative production. Oh my goodness, it included fragrance, pop-ups, fold-outs, removable rep reproductions of artwork, and a variety of paper stocks and textures. The production co costs ultimately killed the magazine. It cost 50 cents at a time when look and life were 20 cents. In November of 1955, the Coles split up, sadly, and Fleur, how, however, Fleur served as Look's foreign editorial consultant in England. After the war, many women, including Charlotte, were displaced from their jobs by returning GIs. Charlotte was displaced from Stryker's Standard Oil project by returning and former FSA, FSA photographers. In 1951, my father arranged for an interview for her at Look Magazine. She was hired and remained the only staff photographer who was a female for 20 years. They, they hired uh, women on a um, freelance basis, but she was the only woman on staff there uh, for the next 20 years. So partly due to Fleur Cole's influence, Look had begun to, un to cover the profound changes in the lives of women, and this was huge changes after, after, the decade, after the decades after the war. Charlotte photographed stories and documented other changing aspects of life for women and for men, um, and she did this throughout her time at Look Magazine. You only have to check out the wonderful exhibition at the Davis Museum to see great examples of this. So beginning in 1946, Arthur Rothstein's work was both on location in the United States and around the world and also in the Look Studio in New York City. Although he was an expert in using traditional tools of photo that photojournalists use, such as the speed graphics shown in Dad's right hand there, uh, he also had access to all of the latest technology. So the Kodak Ektra I was telling you about, John, uh, is hanging around his neck, and that was the very latest. It, was, it had an internally metered, compact, 35 millimeter camera, so it was, it was the newest thing back then. The photographers at Look Magazine always wanted the newest and the best equipment, and, and they wanted to spend as little of their own money as possible. And Arthur, as chief photographer and director of photography, wanted this for them. So the photographers would buy their own equipment, and Look paid a portion of their cost. Mr. Coles, the publisher of Look Magazine, kidding around, asked Arthur why a photographer needed more than one camera. In response, not kidding around, Arthur spread out all of his equipment. Dad was concerned about the issues that affected photojournalists, including their professional education, uh, pro photographers receiving proper credit, and the high incident of divorce among his colleagues. He knew from experience 
that being out on assignment all the time was not good for a marriage. And he co-founded the American Society <laughs> Uh, of, a ma of magazine photographers, the ASMP, to advocate, advocate for photojournalists. Charlotte Brooks was the third woman member of that organization, and both she and Dad served as officers of the ASMP, and Dad took his turn as editor of Infinity, which was the prestigious ASMP magazine. Now I'll tell you about the types of stories Dad covered for Look. He photographed nine American presidents from Roosevelt to Reagan. In 1952, we lived in Manhattan and we used to drive out to Long Island to visit Dad's folks, Izzy and Nettie, nearly every weekend. Dad had an old yellow Plymouth convertible and Mom devised a folding board to convert the back seat into a playpen. The car had no seat belts, of course, so she attached dog leashes to the <laughs> side of the car and around my brother Rob and me and my dad would put the top down and off we'd go. So one Sunday morning, as we drove along, Fleur Cole's beautiful chauffeur-driven limo passed us. And the following morning, Fleur asked Dad if he, oh, told Dad that he had seen, she had seen us looking so happy driving along, and could my parents come put their heads together and come up with a feel-good picture story about family travel. So my parents thought that they could do a, fit, a travel story using product placement in the photographs, which had become a common practice. The idea was that product placement in the stories would prompt advertising sales, which it did. So in this picture, we're wearing Keds. <laughs> Everyone wore Levi's, us kids held Kodak box cameras, and the car, brand new convertible, was the contribution of General Motors. My parents suggested that the story should appear in the yearly vacation issue, which it did, and it, it, was, it was a huge story. It was 25 pictures on eight pages. And we went to all the famous tourist places and posed with gorgeous starlets and movie stars and spent a wonderful day with Roy Rogers and his horse Trigger and, of course, Dale Evans, and it was a wonderful working vacation. <coughs> Picture stories fashioned from our working vacation also appeared in Quick Magazine. Cole's communications really got their money's worth. My father covered the occasional celebrity wedding for look. This is the receiving line at the wedding of actor Tony Curtis on the left and actress Janet Lee in 1951. The other fellow in the middle with Janet is actor-comedian Jerry Lewis. I can only imagine that he asked Tony, may I kiss the bride? <laughs> Dad was preparing to photograph da Salvador Dali in the Look Studio in 1952. Dolly could be a real prima donna. He had a big ego, and his theatrical behavior was just a te technique to draw attention to himself. So Dolly took a piece of charcoal and proceeded to draw on my father's desk blotter. And Cole, uh, Fleur Coles was there, and she was practically drooling, thinking she was going to have an original Dolly that she could put up on her wall. And, uh, but then, when he ran out of room on the, on the blotter, he went all over the desk with the charcoal, and then down, the, down the, the side of the desk, down the leg, and then onto the floor. And uh, Dad said that he could see Fleur's expression change from glee to horror as, as Dolly continued his meandering drawing. Here's uh, Arthur setting up a shoot in the Look Studio. This is another celebrity story on singer and actress Eartha Kitt in 1953. During his long career as technical director of Look, Arthur photographed many aspects of American life, including sports. And this portrait of Jackie and Rachel Robinson and their children accompanied an article in, in 1956 that surprised the world when Jackie divulged that he was retiring from baseball. Many issues of Look featured a food picture. As Look's director of photography, Dad often assigned himself to take the food picture. For 25 years, until Look magazine folded in 1971, Arthur Rothstein created picture stories for the magazine on topics from medicine, to fashion, to New York City. He took this unusual shot of a construction worker playing the bagpipes to relax on his lunch break. 
That's the Empire State Building in the distance. Photography is driven by technology, and Dad invented a camera that took photographs that appeared to be three-dimensional to the naked eye, creating a distinct illusion of depth. The innovation was a result of 13 years of research, and the first exograph was published in Look Magazine on February 5th, 1964. In the mid-60s, Coles Communications published Venture Magazine. It was a travel magazine, and every cover featured a 3D exograph. Dad made every effort to give back to the photography community. He really was a photographer's photographer. He taught throughout his career. He also published nine books and countless newspaper and magazine articles on photography and photojournalism. He hired and mentored many younger photographers besides Charlotte Brooks. These included Stanley Kubrick, who later became a, a cinematographer and movie director, Doug Kirkland, who became famous for working on movie sets and with movie stars, Chester Higgins, known for his career at the New York Times and his photo essays about Africa, and of course, the very young and extremely talented John Shearer. <laughs> this is a nice snapshot of Dad in his home office. He was on assignment in Israel in 1971 when Gardner Coles announced the shocking news that Look would cease to print. In an interview the following year, Dad explained that Look relied on millions of readers subscribing by mail to provide a large audience for advertisers. 5.5 million copies of each issue were sent through the mail, a 142% hike and the cost of postage hit the bottom line. Look's advertisers were shifting to television. The final blow was an untimely strike at, at General Motors that resulted in $9 million of canceled automobile advertising. So this explains why a popular magazine with a circulation of almost 7 million would fail suddenly and leave the staff, including <laughs> Charlotte Brooks, unemployed. <coughs> Uh, so Life Magazine ceased weekly publication just a few months after Look, and the golden age of magazine photojournalism drew to a close. Still, those magazines and photojournalists like Charlotte Brooks had demonstrated the power and the intimacy of the person-centered photo essay that endures to this day. Arthur stayed on at Look during the transition. He was asked to oversee the transport of some five million pictures, negatives, transparencies, contact sheets, and documents to the Library of Congress. Around this time, in the early 70s, Dad met with his friend Alan Fern, director of prints and photographs at the Library of Congress. Eventually, uh, Dad also sent a good deal of his own personal archival material to the Library of Congress. In 2013, the Rothstein family created an additional Arthur Rothstein archive at the Avery Library at, at Columbia University, where Dad's alma mater. Uh, the New York City-related look photographs went to the Museum of the City of New York. After, leaks, after Look ceased publication, Art went to work as director of photography and then associate editor at Parade, the Sunday's newspaper magazine founded in 1941. Parade remains the most widely read magazine in the United States with a circulation of 22 million in 700 newspapers and a readership of 54 million. Dad stayed at Parade until his death in 1985. He had a little fun using himself uh, for the cover of this issue. <laughs> That's Dad's photograph of Diana Ross at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in 1982. He loved photographing parades, and of course the whole family always went. Now we'll share a few pictures from our family photo album. Both my parents, Arthur and Grace, were professional photographers, and for much of my childhood, Mom had a portrait studio behind the house and Dad worked for Look Magazine. Our lives were captured in photo essays, much like the professionally crafted picture stories that Arthur, Charlotte, and John produced for millions of Look readers. Both 
my parents shot occasional advertisements, sometimes featuring us kids as models, like this post Sugar Crisp ad. That was me. <laughs> when I think of the stories behind my father's photographs, I'm reminded of my favorite scene from the Mad Men television series. Mad Men was about the advertising business in the 1960s. In my favorite scene, advertising executive Don Draper is making a pitch to the guys from Kodak who are looking for an ad campaign for their new slide projector, which is what we used to use to show photographs before PowerPoint. The Kodak guys thought the ad campaign should emphasize space age, their space age technology, or the, project, or the projector, which looked like this, should be called the wheel. But Don Draper had a better idea. I think his pitch to Kodak could apply to any slideshow, or just as well to any of Arthur or Charlotte's or John's intimate, pro provocative look photo essays. Don Draper said that on a rare occasion, on rare occasion, the public can be engaged through a sentimental bond with the product. He said, one of the deepest bonds can be nostalgia. Nostalgia, he said, means a bittersweet longing for the past. It's a twinge in your heart. far more powerful than memory alone. <coughs> he said this slide projector isn't a spaceship. It's a time machine. It goes backwards, forwards. It takes us to a place where we ache to go again. Don Draper said, it's not called the wheel. It's called the carousel. <laughs> because a carousel lets us travel the way a child travels, round and round. Round and round, and back home again <clears throat> to a place where we know we are loved. And that's my talk. I forgot to mention one of the most interesting things about Annie's biography, which was that after she raised her two kids, she went back to school and she got her BA, MA, and PhD in a row. And her PhD was in, in interdisciplinary studies with a focus on the expressive art of healing and social change. And her dissertation was about her father's legacy, but also she drew on photographs from the family album and um, she wrote about the value of telling and listening to the stories. So, Thank yeah. You. Thank you. So, um, okay. Let me just quickly switch presentations here. There we go. Whoa, what a stud. <laughs> <laughs> so, it is my great pleasure to introduce John Shear. <laughs> Um, John has been a photographer, a writer, a director, a lecturer, and a professor. At 17 years old, he was, the, he was one of the youngest staff photographers at a, ma at a major publication when he, ha when he was hired by Look Magazine, where he covered civil rights and the race riots of the 1960s. He was hired by Life in 1968, where he was the second African-American staff photographer in the magazine's history. The first was none other than Gordon Parks. 
Scher won 175 National Photography Awards. His work has been exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, MoMA, and the Whitney. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Glad to be here. <laughs> and thank you all for coming. Okay, so the way this is going to work is Brody has offered to help us in this, the slideshow, and uh, John and I will be talking about his work at Look and at Life and more than that. Okay. So, And I guess, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, perfect. Who is that? Who is that? Oh, I, mean, I remember that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Could we have the next slide? Yeah, so, it's Richie Havens. Tell us, so this is a selection of pictures from the look years that mm -hmm. you sent me, and I put them all in the PowerPoint. Tell us about how you began at Look. What was it like? How did you start? The kinds of assignments you got, just how it felt. It started for me um, in my relationship with Look and then later with Life uh, because of a couple of shows I had, photographic shows I had. Um, I was lucky enough, I was lucky enough early on uh, to have a show at the Kodak Exhibition Center. Uh, the Kodak Exhibition Center, for those of you who have been to New York, is uh, where the Apple Store is now, the Grand Central Station. And in those years, when you walked through the station, they had a transparency that was probably 75 or 60 feet long and 20 feet wide. And they would have a picture uh, of basically a, a, a scenic image. Anyway, I was lucky enough to have a show there. And uh, that day, I met one of the people who changed my life a great deal, and that was Arthur Rostin. He came to the show. And uh, we talked a great deal, and uh, I told him that I wanted, to, when I grew up, to be a staff photographer at Look and Life magazine, and he smiled. Um, and, and, you know, that's kind of where it started. And one day he, uh, you know, and he said to me that day, you know, one of the things that's going to be very hard for you, and when you're a young kid, it, hard is a word that you really don't even know how to spell very well, uh, is that, you know, you're a black person, and it's going to be very difficult for you to go and travel throughout the country. You know, which is the essence of what you have to do uh, as a, and will have to do as a young photographer. Um, and you need to think about that. You need to think about what that means. I mean, you need to work on your skills. You need to work on lots of things. Because as a little boy, I didn't really know how to read, um, and it was photography and my love for it that got me to sit down because I, I was self-taught and you know the only place I could find out about what it was to print a picture or to, you know what all that technical stuff meant was at the library and so I struggled and struggled and struggled you know and finally fortunately the old brain started to take a little bit of it in but I was a very shy kid and uh, he said that's going to be your other problem you know you really want to run away and hide and in order for you to take pictures, you got to go out in the world. you got to take pictures of things or something, or people, maybe. But for me, I guess I was lucky in that the camera was this amazing shield. All of a sudden, I became like Superman or something, you know? I mean, nothing could ever touch me, I felt, you know? Because I was able to hide behind that camera. I will get to uh, Bridge Havens in these pictures in a minute. <laughs> but you can look at them. That's the King Funeral there. But... Um, so he said all that, and I kind of took it in, and I was lucky enough, my father had a very good friend named Gordon Parks, and, uh, and my father was an artist as well. And uh, they talked to me about it, and they said, well, you know, you're going to have to think about it, how that's going to work for you. Um, and I said, you know, I want to do this, Dad. I really do. I want to try, see if I can do it. I love photography. It's the only thing I can know how to do, and I don't even really know that, you know. Um, so, kind of quite by accident, I ran into Arthur again, and again, I had a lot of shows and stuff, and he, he was nice enough to maybe stop by, and uh, said, you know, have you given that any thought? And, you know, Kennedy had died, and, uh, you know, um, actually, this was slightly before that, but 
you know, he said, listen, you know, if you can figure out a way to get down to Washington, if you can figure out lots of things, you know, maybe, possibly, you know, you, maybe you can make some pictures. And I uh, figured out a way to get down, borrowed some money from my dad and stuff. And uh, got down there where he did hook up. And um, I kind of guess wanted to show the world that I could actually take pictures. Mainly I wanted to show myself that I could take pictures. And uh, I didn't really know much about doing the story. I didn't know much about doing anything, quite honestly. But I wandered around and figured a place and found a place, asked people where to go and where I should be. and. You know, caught up with Arthur, and he said, "You know, keep your keep your eyes open. You know, try to capture some emotion maybe in your pictures." And I was lucky enough to to make a picture uh, there that day. And uh, I had a dark room at home, and I went home to process my film. And luckily for me, I had a, there was a boiler, and the house boiler was in my dark room, and it seemed that every time I went to develop my film, somehow that's when the boiler would come on. And it would illuminate the dark room a little bit. Help me find the film that I somehow had on the counter that I couldn't find. But didn't do great things for my negatives. Um, you know, they were supposed to be kind of clear and mostly, you know, and mine were kind of gray and stuff. But I tell you that's right because what that did was the picture that I did make that day had this incredible detail in the highlights and shadows and all of that. And uh, it really helped the picture a lot. The picture didn't run until a bit later, but when it did, it really kind of changed my life around. You know, and people got, other people beyond my mother, uh, got a bit more interested in my pictures. And, um, and, and I decided I really needed to go to work and I really needed to try to really become more serious about making pictures as opposed to just taking them, which is one of the things that, <laughs> that, uh, uh, I learned certainly through Arthur and Gordon and people like that. And so that's kind of really when it started for me. In the beginning, young photographers, you know, they go out and they try to photograph a lot of things. And not very many people see them because they don't run them in the magazine in the beginning very often. So I had lots and lots of those. I told my mother about them. You know, she really applauded a lot. You know, so did you take that picture? <laughs> Forty years later, she got to see it, maybe, you know. But, um, you know, it started slowly, and uh, one thing led to another. And, of course, I was a kid kid, right? I mean, I'm talking, you know, like 16, 17 years old, right? And so um, I started to go places that I had never been. I started to cover things because I got a little bit braver, you know, like I said, it was my cameras, really, um, that uh, were a little bit more interesting. And it was during a period where the country was changing dramatically. And I was changing with it, but it was changing dramatically. And I got placed, sent to garden spots like, um, you know, Philadelphia, Mississippi. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to spend a few days up at Attica inside the prison. Um, you know, so, so I started to get an opportunity, and I don't, I don't mean to kind of bring together what looking like, but. You know, but I started to cover, you know, uh, more serious stories. Because I didn't know how to read, I think I said that earlier, uh, I never wanted anybody to know that. And I'm sorry for all these digressions, but I never wanted anybody to know that. And so I would sit and I would pretend that I was reading. And really, I, you know, could tell you every nuance about some story that was in this book, but I couldn't read a word of it. I tell you that only because I guess what that did was it led me to have an interest in telling stories because I made them up so often. And, um, you know, I really thought about that a great deal. I realized that there were lots of different kinds of stories. There was lots of different ways to approach stories. That there were two kinds of imagery. I mean, there was that first person imagery that we're so familiar with right now that we see a lot where the person, the image maker, is kind of central to the image and that the subject is reacting to them very directly. And then there's a third person approach where invisibility is the key, where you want to be invisible and uh, you can turn that off if you want to, <laughs> but uh, 
you know, that, that, you can see I was never a filmmaker because I'm not in sync. <laughs> but the um, that was the kind of stories, those were the types of stories that I was most interested in doing and worked hard at doing. Um, so that's the direction that I tried to go in, and I'm digressed too much and put me back on track. No, not, a, not at all. Um, so when you when you first started working at Look Magazine, but at Life too, and you know you realized that there was a very specific format for when you're talking about how you were interested in storytelling. Yes. Yeah. You know they had a format that was set out, and that was the picture story format with the grids and with the art department. They did, they did. So how did you, as a photographer, feel about that? Did you feel like it was in, in some way blocking your creative output, or did you feel like, well, that's the form, and I'm going to see how I'm going to work through that? How did you respond to that, especially as you were 17 when you started that career? Well, you know, I think, uh, not I think, I mean, I know for sure that, you know, that's something that people talked about a great deal, uh, talked with me about a great deal. Uh, what I thought about it, it's hard to say because I certainly listened and learned a lot. I realized that there was a lot I didn't know, you know, in terms of doing a story or being grown up enough to wear a suit, you know. And so after I learned to tie my shoes and stuff, I, you know, I said, gee, let me really try to master that. But there was a bunch of us that were kind of mavericks and, um, you know, we uh, basically were allowed to go off and work and encouraged to work because we were the loners, right? We were the shy people who wanted to be invisible and kind of really kind of creep off by ourselves and, and take our pictures. And so while lots of things were scripted, our stories often weren't scripted because that's just the nature of who we were. And if you gave us a script, we would be in trouble. <laughs> you know, learning how to read it would take a while and then to really actually do it. And as I say, you know, I guess, uh, yeah, and there was a number of us actually, and I was lucky enough, in fact, uh, to work with someone who became a dear friend, a guy from Birmingham, a kind of Bernard Merritt. Uh, but we were both very much alike, and um, you know, we realized that there were different kinds of uh, stories. You know, I mean, there was a typical what we call follow story, where it's a big event and you're you're kind of following it throughout the day. That type of story. Um, there was something that we called the parallel picture story, you know, which is basically two points of view that basically build on each other and in some cases are kind of contradictory, you know, to one another. And, uh, you know, so Vernon and I decided to do a story of that type. We did a story of Pritchard, Alabama, and near the end, and Vernon, and Pritchard was, I should just quickly say, uh, was the center of clan activity in the state of Alabama. And they got someone ran for mayor named Jay Cooper, and uh, and uh, so it was interesting to us to go do a story on Pritchard and look at it, uh, you know, from the standpoint of some of the people that lived there who were affected by this change. And so Vernon photographed the clan, and uh, I photographed Jay and the clan, <laughs> and. Uh, this, the pictures are radically different, and I think actually it's probably the best story I ever did. He ever did. And we were best friends. We shot. Oh, this is a digression again. Sorry. Uh, we shot back to back. Mm -hmm. You know, so we would go and we did a lot of riots and stuff. And um, so I would shoot one way and look one way, mm -hmm. and he would shoot the other way. And he said, you see that man, that cop's coming, man, you know, we better be careful. And um, and that's how we did our stories, you know, and, uh, you know, we really looked out for each other. And he uh, initially worked for Black Star, which was this little agency, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Uh, I'm kidding you. Of course, you've heard, <laughs> tell me more about photography than I even know. But, uh, you know, he, um, so he was working for Black Star. I, I started, I first met him when I was working at Look, but we really became you know, kind of colleague, colleagues, when we got, both got the life magazine. And so we went down to do this uh, story and, uh, you know, we just, we loved it and it was, you know, the clan was after us. I mean, they chased us for two hours one night. And uh, because I was a very stupid young man who tried to date some waitress that I shouldn't. 
and they took an exception to that. But um, so after being chased, uh, he, uh, and we survived it. And you know, the we were feeling good. The story was about done. Guy named Dave Sheridan was the writer at down that story. <laughs> Although there was not much writing to do. <clears throat> and we're getting feeling good, and we're coming driving back to the hotel. Or no, actually, about to go out to see Jay. And on the radio it comes. We're announcing today uh, that Life magazine will be closing. And uh, the magazine closed two months later, and the story never ran. But I made a couple good prints of pictures. <laughs> but on that note, so speaking of. Um, no, that's fine, that's fine, we'll get to it. Can we get. Okay. So on that note, when I was researching the Charlotte Brooks exhibition, and I was looking through the Library of Congress archives of Look Magazine, there was one story that I found, and I found it to be particularly <coughs> interesting. Uh, so you shot the funeral of Martin Luther King, you shot um, the ceremony that was held in Alabama, um, it, no, that was held in Savannah, sorry, that was held in Savannah two or three days after the funeral, and uh, let's move, okay, and um, the story never ran. Look, nope. never published the story. No, nope. so that's my luck. You know, I'm so lucky. <laughs> but it is a it is an extremely well shot story. There's a narrative to it. You're following the procession. You're following the most important people who are present. There's a lot of energy to it. There's a lot of mourning. Um, there's an atmosphere that's being captured, very. Um, You're kind. Potently, but I I want to know more about how you approached that particular topic, especially coming to it after several years of covering the civil rights movement, um, and after several years of really putting forth stories that uh, only few photographers um, you know, fought to have access to, because you were following uh, events that were, as you're describing, occurring in extremely dangerous, potentially dangerous circumstances uh, that many not, not many photographers um, engaged in you know, there was a, there was a certain amount of personal risk there. So coming out of that, getting to the point in 1968 when uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and then shooting this story, tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess that was my beat. You know, I uh, we all have to have a beat, I guess, and that was mine. I uh, and I felt lucky to have it. Um, but they say uh, something. <laughs> And I guess I said it too, as I get to be the damn near seventy, is that uh, repertorial photography is for the young. You know, I mean, I think you're probably best at it when you're young. First of all, I have trouble bending down now, and I find it very frustrating. <laughs> and uh, my cameras are getting lighter, although uh, cameras are not getting so much lighter. But um, you know, I think that uh, during that period of my life, I uh, felt that there's no possible way anything's going to happen to me because I, I'm you know, having fun, you know, this is what I want to do. Um, and I think that there were lots of times that I felt rather frustrated because, uh, you know, the kinds of things that I was covering didn't always get run. Um, that was just the nature of it. I mean, uh, as uh, Anne eloquently talked about the fact that there were advertisers that paid the freight. And uh, quite often, the kinds of imagery and stories that I was doing. People didn't really want to see. And America was a rather divided camp during that period. And so when I went down to Philadelphia, Mississippi, to find out if a couple boys from New Rochelle were still alive, and they weren't, people back then didn't want to know all about that. They kind of wanted to look the other way. And I guess, you know, initially you're uh, rather optimistic and you hope, oh, they're going to run my pictures. I'm going to make better pictures this time than last time. I screwed up last time. So watch out for this time. <coughs> and um, so you, you went out and tried to do it. But, but, I, but I also became, you know, more and more committed and understood more fully what my role was. That it was important for me to make these pictures. They didn't really have a lot of folks of color. I mean, I, I understand how I say what I'm about to say, but while the magazines appeared to be very, very liberal, it was very, very also Jim Crow 
to some large degree, right? And so I was lucky to have this job, and you know, I, I wanted it, and you know, I'm pretty self-educated, not completely, but uh, I mean, I did, there was something with an S on it once that I went into a room, but I'm kidding. But the, um, but I realized though that, you know, study was important, and I read almost everything I could, and I can remember the day that I read a book uh, by a guy named Franz Fanon called Wretched of the Earth, uh, I was covering the Black Panthers, and uh, I said, wow, that's really what this is all about, isn't it? This is this whole point of view thing, you know? And uh, try to understand more fully what I was doing and that there was a reason and, you know, what was the underlying meaning? And, you know, I was lucky enough because part of the problem, you know, that people like myself had was that you were photographing things and people that did not necessarily want to be photographed. I mean, they just did not in any way, really, want you to be photographed. I mean, there were times I was lucky I photographed Muhammad Ali, he was great. Yeah, sure, take my picture, Johnny. But, you know, in terms of those situations, they often didn't really want you to be there. And you had to learn to find ways, and the gang story I did is kind of an example of some of that, but to make people comfortable enough so that you could take their picture. And I had gotten a little bit better at that. So, you know, by the time we flash forward or backward or wherever, wherever we're supposed to be, um, you know, got to the King pictures. Um, I had done a lot of that kind of work. I had done a lot of marching. I had learned not to wear Ferragamo loafers on a 75 mile march because your feet were hurt. Um, but, you know, I really wanted to tell that story. And of course, I was completely devastated by the fact that King had been killed. And, uh, you know, the. Uh, I guess the hardest part of the story was the march to get to the church, because the march to get to the church, and the couple of days for me at least preceding that, you know, were kind of a rough go, because while, I, you know, my brother and my guys had lots of whites as well, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're touched and, you know, wanted that story told. There was a whole lot of people that didn't. And those were all the ones that I got to meet, you know. And so um, they were there, but I was more determined than ever to try to tell the story. And I had gotten to the point, again, one of the things I learned over time, I learned a little bit, fortunately, about some of the techni techniques behind stuff, and it was because of guys like Arthur, really, you know, who, you know, uh, you know, there were a few super educated photographers, he was one of them, we have another guy that I know quite well named Arne John Lowengard, but I say that in passing only in that, they, they, they had a great, in addition to the great pictures, they, they, they really cared about the technology and understood the technology. And so, you know, I would get out there and it was a very flat day and it's not that you're lying, but I said, well, gee, what do I need to do to try to make this a bit more dramatic somehow? I'm not going to not tell the truth, but if I could make the sky seem a little darker and the eyes seem a little whiter and make all that kind of happen somehow magically, and this is, there was no Photoshop back then, right? Um, and I wasn't going to be necessarily completely processing and in control of these images. Um, you know, what, what, what can I do? How can I goose it a little bit? And so underexposing and overdeveloping some of those kinds of tricks were the things that I started to apply. And, you know, in the very beginning, we didn't have a lot of metering systems in our camera. You know, I mean, I wasn't cool like her father. <laughs> you know, I had the first fully automatic camera in the world. I didn't, I didn't have that. I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> But uh, I know I did. That's, that was your dad. Uh, but but that became important. And so when you start to look at the the pictures on the hillside and all of that stuff, you know some of that is at work. And you know when to and obviously when to you know, hopefully when to make the picture. The pictures, you know, the, you know. And I know I needed that picture. You know, I, I said, well, I, I got to set up the story. How's that going to work? You know. And I think that. And going back, just to clarify something, because of course you were right, because you're smarter than me, you know. But, you know, in terms of the list and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. uh, while I said that, you know, we were mavericks and, you know, we didn't necessarily always follow the rule book, I did often actually make a list myself of the pictures for myself to make sure, because I'm kind of stupid, that I made them, you know. Uh, and is the camera still loaded? 
oh, it is. I better not open the back of it before I rewind it. You know, I mean, things like that were fundamentally important. No, I'm kidding. But the, uh, so yes, I did make a list. I knew I had to make an opener. Uh, I also knew <clears throat> at that point, and I had made a lot of King pictures over the years, but I also knew that by, at the end of it all, those were when, while those pictures are going to be important, those are going to be the least in interesting picture, least interesting pictures for me. Because he was going to be in this box, and there were going to be a lot of people passing by, and there was going to be reflections, and there was going to be all this stuff, and I knew that was coming. And while that was a serious high drama, and they were some lucky enough to make that King picture, you know, in a more open environment, if you will, and I knew that was not going to be my fate. And so my images, and I learned this from her father, really were going to be about the getting to that church. My pictures were going to happen before I got to the church. And again, you know, another Arthur thing is, you know, it, you got to find the emotion in your pictures. And in order to do that, you have to find the emotion in yourself and be able to apply it to what you're looking at. And so, you know, that was basically the approach I used. Um, you know, I still, I carry probably more cameras than I needed, but, you know, because cameras have never been that important <laughs> to me, you know, I mean, in terms of, I'm sorry. But no, but speaking of emotion, let's go to the next. So I wanted to bring one more story. Um, yeah, running away. I'm sorry. No, we're not, we're not, we're good, we're good. Um, and this was one of your most uh, famous <clears throat> stories. Um, and this is really how I, how I encountered your work um, when you, when you photographed. Um, the Attica um, prison revolt. So tell us a little bit about this story. It's an incredibly powerful story. You were the only photographer who stayed throughout the many days inside Attica. Um, yes, tell us a little bit about this story. Well, Attica, the, I, I covered a lot of stories in the Black Panthers and um, was... Uh, Able for that reason, the the editors at this is a Life magazine. The editors uh, wanted me to see if I could hook up with George Jackson, who was in prison at that time. And a buddy of mine, a guy named uh, Charles Charles, and I went, and we were able to talk with him. And uh, he was killed about two days later. They said he tried to escape and had a gun in his hair. And of course, his hair is about this long, right? Must have been a heck of a gun. But as a result of some of that, uh, and as a result of the stories I had done earlier, uh, the when the riot first occurred, I mean first first occurred, uh, there were a number of people that they asked if they would come to the prison. And I was among them. And uh, we, I went. Um, and uh, when I got there, you know, they were, the people inside the prison were excited and anxious to have us. And of course, the people outside the prison were not so interested in all that, except for the fact that this was Life Magazine, of course, right? No big deal, right? And so the writer at the time, kind of Bob Stokes, who was a dear friend, I haven't seen him in 50 years, well, no, not, not that, I've seen more than that, but. Uh, you know, come on, Bob made this deal that, uh, you know, that they could use the pictures in the pool, which meant that uh, life had their pick, and then other publications could use the work. <clears throat> and so, eventually, and it's all, it happened very quickly. You know, it did, I'm making it sound like it went on for weeks and we're talking hours and stuff, right? <clears throat> but very quickly, I uh, was able to uh, get inside the prison. And um, I tell you, I think once, I mean, I've been to a lot of odd situations, but I think that walking in to the prison uh, was probably one of the hardest, harder things I ever had to do. Um, there were many times I used a gas mask and stuff, but, you know, there was something I learned many years earlier in that if you had a little bottle of vinegar with some cotton in it right in your shirt pocket, that that was one of your key tools. Almost as important as your camera, because the uh, the vinegar um, 
that had been soaked in cotton. And when you stuck it in your nose, kept your eyes clear. So I had my little bottle of vinegar and cotton and whatever number of cameras I had, and I don't know how many rolls of film I had, but, uh, and I got in and, uh, you know, I started to kind of, in really kind of wander around. Uh, yeah, I did ultimately get to cell block D and get into the courtyard and all that stuff. Um, and um, initially there were other people that were inside. I don't want to make it sound like I'm the only one ever who was inside that joint because it's not true. Uh, but, you know, we were notified that they were going to come in and they strongly suggested that you leave. This is time. This was the this was the National Guard. Was right, the right, Army. yeah. And they actually, at one point, they were flying over with helicopters, right? And, you know, telling the inmates, put down your stuff, give it all back, let's go. And, of course, the inmates were in an unfortunate position because initially, when they took over, uh, a guard was pushed through a glass door, and he died. And so when he died, and that took a few days, I can't. I don't remember, but uh, get walking away was off the table, right? And it was rather sad uh, in that uh, Oswald, who was the uh, head of corrections, uh, was a real reformer. And Nelson Rockefeller hung him out to dry, ostensibly. You know, I mean, he said, okay, you're in charge, this is your deal, uh, you're, these are your calls to make. And, you know, the thing happened, people, a lot of people died, and, you know, the rest is history. But, but I think that, um, you know, it was a tough period, and it was some amazing people, it was, uh, you know, and I learned a lot about myself during that period, you know, in terms of how I felt and how I grew up a little bit. So how do you feel about those pictures when you look back at them now? You know, I, I hope they, um, somehow in a, in a reasonable way kind of uh, show people what I felt about that period. Uh, one of the things about my work is I've always been a bit of a pictorialist. Um, so the, 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 the imagery I was trying to make during that period was a bit more illustrative than some. Um, and I guess I was at a good place in terms of that being able to make images that way. Um, and it kind of demonstrates my feelings about that. Um, there is a bit of invisibility in the pictures. Uh, I lost a lot of them over trials and people have taken them and borrowed them and all that, but that's fine, that's what they're there for. I still have a couple left over, fortunately. But, um, you know, I, it was, uh, it was an important time and a sad time. And they, you know, when they went in, um, I guess it was a couple minutes before they kind of flew over, and they told us that, uh, you know, okay, we're coming in, we're going to retake the, the yard. And they started to drop CS gas from like helicopters and stuff. And at a certain point, I probably could see about four or five feet. And that first picture that you showed was a guard who got his head blown off, ostensibly, really. And he was like two feet from me. And, um, you know, you couldn't really see, you know. And sadly, a lot of the pictures, some of the pictures that I lost, whatever happened to them, who knows, you know, were some of those where you could kind of see a lot of that fog and gas and stuff, you know, uh, whatever. But, you know, I remember that saying, what, what is that sound? What is that? You know, and it wasn't until you realized really what it was and said, oh shit, I don't know, I shouldn't say that, I'm sorry. Uh, but, you know, you started to realize really what it was that you were taking pictures of. And uh, the only thing, you know, stupid me. Gee, I'll have a film, you know. I mean, that's like the first thing I'm thinking about, you know. And where did I put my film? Damn it, I can't find it, it's here somewhere. But, um, you know, it was the right time for me, you know, in terms of the pictures. Um, you know, I had been through a lot of stuff, you know, it's not to say that, yes, there was nothing new. <laughs> the beautiful thing about what we did was, 
every day had a new aspect to it, or often, you know. And it's good for us that, that it was that way because we were so fucking stupid, excuse me, we're stupid that if it weren't that way, we would have thrown it all away, you know. But um, the, uh, so, yeah, I think they reflect how I felt a good deal. And one day, I've always had this thing while I'm doing a book for someone right now, I've always had this thing about not wanting to do a coffee table book. Mm -hmm. One of the things, and there are a lot of folks, uh, and I can probably tell you something about this, but you know, like a guy like um, Cartier Brisson, mm -hmm. legendary guy, surrealist, right? I mean, he's amazing. <clears throat> but he never wanted to have his picture taken, mm -hmm. ever. And he had a big falling out with that guy, another buddy, David Duncan, who you probably remember. Because David took his picture. And he put his picture in the magazine because Sean Callahan, who you might remember, conned him and said, oh, he'll think that that's fine. He'll like that picture. No. no. And it sounds all rather pretentious, but you know, there was a feeling that you really didn't want to have your picture taken because you were not the star. You were the vessel. You know, you were there. You were the collector. That was your gig, you know. And so you didn't really want your picture taken a whole lot, because that just got in your way. You know, you didn't want people to know what you look like. And the same thing was true in terms of the finality of doing a, a big book of your pictures. First of all, how much do you like them? And with me, that changes every five minutes. But, you know, it, that wasn't about that, you know, at the time. I didn't even know I'm getting into talking about this book stuff. But, but you know, I mean, I think I had that way about it. Just that, that permanence on one level, okay, but a whole other feeling about permanence on another level, where I wanted the pictures. Well, I don't want to be that was I wanted those pictures to have a certain permanence. Mm -hmm. Maybe be lucky enough so that people might remember them, mm -hmm. and that was important too. Well, I got that from her old man. Gordon Parks, you know, and a whole bunch of folks. I was with a guy named Eli Reed and a guy named Sebastian Salgado. I think I shared that earlier with you. You know, and they're saying, well, God damn it, you're finally getting over being an asshole and you're going to do this book, mm -hmm. you know, finally. And I'm sorry, my language is bad. But the uh, photographers, <laughs> that's what you can't take it. Photographers anywhere. But the, uh, but I think that, you know, I got, I was starting to get over that and, you know, my kids are happy. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're doing a book. And I have to say that with this <coughs> project on Charlotte Brooks, uh, maybe one of my my regrets was that she really never got to it. And um, I think that, you know, your work is there. It's in the archives. And um, even the stories that weren't published, they're just as present. And they can be made permanent also through the work of others. Maybe it's not all your responsibility, you know? Okay. Yeah. So on that note, I wish we could continue, but I want to allow everybody else to uh, ask some questions and to continue the conversation. So I'll ask Annie to join us up here. I'm going to put the microphone yes, here. Uh, and um, just because we're recording, actually, what I'm going to do is I'll pass on a mic. I'll, I'll just um, I'll leave the two of you up here alone. <coughs> And, um, okay, does anybody have a question? Uh-huh. There's a book out now on the Attica riot, and it's a very uh -huh. disturbing book of what the, uh, Nelson Rockefeller did. He's the one, the liberal, uh, who uh, put... The governor. Right, the liberal, and what, how they dehumanized the black men there after the riot. And I don't know how you kept your emotion in check filming these scenes. If I was you, I would have like thrown the camera at somebody. How did you do that? How did you separate yourself from it? Well, you know, our way of throwing a camera is to try to take a good picture, you know, I think that so. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I think it was awful, the treatment that they received. I mean, I can remember a situation where, you know, they made uh, many of the prisoners strip and crawl. And they shot fire hoses on them. And they ran a gauntlet. And they ran a gauntlet, that's right. And, um, you know, when you see that, I think your stomach churns. It's also part of the reason you're there is to record that. 
the trouble is that you record that and 90 times out of 100, you know, never gets run because the people sometimes making the choices find that a little offensive. I don't know if our readers are going to really want to look at that image very long. And of course, those are the images that are, you know, so important. So I certainly um, was angry. I, yeah, by that point in my career, um, and again, I was, I was a young guy, but I uh, covered lots and lots of stories and I traveled lots and lots of days doing this kind of stuff. And, and I was just angry as one could possibly be probably by that point and realized, you know, this double standard that I lived somehow and that I was being paid and I was being well paid you know, to, to make my pictures and to do that stuff and to cover the stories that I was there to cover. But that it did have a certain importance and all the people that I really was worried about being criticized by were really excited that I was doing these pictures, you know, saying, you know, you're, you're there telling that story, you know. I don't know, I could have been 105, I have no idea. Then, well, no, I mean, how old was I? I mean, I started, so I started, you know, uh, making pictures when I was in my teens and stuff, and kind of got on staff and stuff at 17. So what am I, in my early to mid-20s, I guess, during that? But, so uh, so or, that's why you were so brave, because yeah, you were brave. Yeah. Like you were saying. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right, you know. And um, if you had actually looked at all those cops, all those white cops, and you were your age, you would not feel the same way as you did back then. There's no question about it. Yeah. yeah no, no, I mean, and as I said earlier, you know, it's kind of for the young, yeah. in a way, you know. Um, but, you know, as I say, you, you either love it or you don't. I mean, I, when I taught, I used to teach at Columbia, sadly for Columbia. And um, one of the things I would say often to young folks when they're getting started is, you only do this if you really like it, you know. I mean, you, you're not doing it for the money. Don't let anybody lie to you and tell you that you're going to be recognized or famous and stuff because that's my, that's probably not going to happen. You're going to have trouble with, you know, maybe you're paying your rent and doing all that stuff. But if you love it, then you love it and then it's great, yeah. you know, and you're lucky enough to be people like her father and others, you know, who were mad, had a mastery in what they did. And so I was lucky in that regard. Right place, right time. Right place, right time. That's right. You know, and I said, I said facetiously, well, the 60s were cool, but you should have checked out the 50s in magazine photography. They were twice as many magazines back yeah, then. Yeah, right. anyway. Does anyone else have a question? Mm -hmm. I wondered if um, you, you talk about youth giving you courage, but you also spoke about um, the camera as a kind of shield that you, on the one hand, it's a technical interface, but also you honestly in these pictures are in, probably instantaneously sizing up the visual, the composition, the light, the tone, relationships. And does that, is that a part of courage? <laughs> uh, I guess, uh, that's a good question. Um, let me talk about one part of the question first. One of the things about trying to be the type of repertorial photographer that I wanted, trying to be what I wanted to be, was the notion of practice and learning my tool really well. Learning how to size up, as you aptly put, the image. Knowing which lens you probably needed to make that picture. Understanding the significance between 1.4 and f32. Um, and because of people like her dad, I, I'm going to keep using this name, okay. um, and Gordon and others, I practice like hell. I practice all the time. I could take my cameras apart in the dark, I could put them back together. I first started out, you know, kind of, uh, kind of a little shaky, so I could take a picture in a half second. I could take a picture at a thirtieth of a second, a little less <laughs> got down, you know, to a fifteenth of a second. You know, we're still pretty sharp, looking pretty good, because you understand how people are moving through the frame. 
and you need to know, you need to learn what kind of speed you might need to kind of freeze that action. And you're looking at them because there needs to be a pause in their movement as well, right? So, you, you know, you're starting to learn and size that stuff up. You know, and you get to a point where you can shoot down darn near a half second. And once you get to that point, you know, you're kind of on your way because, you know, we didn't carry a lot of tripods back then. You know, I was lucky, you know, I often couldn't carry much of anything. I mean, I, I had the same lenses on each camera. I didn't change lenses, so I'd have a 1.435 millimeter lens on this camera always. And there was a guy who used to take our cameras to a guy named Marty Forster, a professional camera pair in New York, and he would actually fit the lenses in the bodies, right, so that they worked together. And unless something deep happened, those lenses never came off those bodies, you know. I mean, they, that was that was it, you know, and clean around it, right? So, you know, I think it was really about practice. And I tell my kids, who are both artists, you know, uh, two things, if you're going to be an artist. Because to be an artist, you have to treat your art like it's work, because it is work. It's your work. And you decided to make it your work. And so when Monday comes, your ass better be up at 5.30 in the morning, just like mine. And when it rolls around to 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, when you're kind of tired and you're done, that's good. Because now you can stop to start again tomorrow. And so you need to have that inner discipline, and you need to practice and practice and practice. My daughter's a musician, and boy, her scales were awful in the beginning. And she squeaked. And it was tough going as mom and dad. And she had, my wife used to have this thing, but she was very disciplined. And so she would get up early, early to practice. And my wife said to her one day, well, okay. Now you see the window in your room? Okay. Now, we see that big round thing? Okay. You see how it's kind of moving? The sun or the moon, right? When it gets to be midway, then you can start. <laughs> Don't start before that. We're trying to get a little sleep before work. But she would, you know, she would practice and squeak and squeak and squeak and squeak and now you listen to her. She's got albums and travels all over the place. And, you know, and my son, printmaker, you know, again, practice, practice, practice. You gotta do it. I think that's the hardest part for when people are getting started, is developing that inner discipline because they have the time they want to be artists so they don't have to work very hard. You know, they think, oh that's cool. I don't have to study anymore. Right. SATs, I don't need those. I just need a good portfolio to get an art school, right? Maybe not here at Whistling, but you know. <laughs> Even at Columbia we tested you once in a while to get into the class. Right. Anyway. I, uh, I, I'm just curious about your feeling that back in the day of look and life, where uh, stories were told by pictures, that you know, the work that you would do would then still come to an editor, and these would be um, edited and cropped and organized to, to help tell the story. And today, you know, there's an argument that I've heard many times that, well, this is sort of, uh, it's an editorial comment and we're getting a slanted view of what the events, uh, what the events were. But today, um, uh, some feel it's purer to have, with everybody having a, a camera, essentially, and everybody's now a photographer and maybe a photojournalist. And now the stories come in by all these random thousand points of light, so to speak, and, they f and people feel, well, this is a more pure version of the story, but it's really uh, points of light from all different sources, and uh, maybe that tells a more complete story, but maybe it doesn't tell a story at all. So what's your feeling, basically, about how uh, a well-composed photo essay, as in the day of the picture magazines versus how photos are just uploaded a billion a day and trying to tell a story that way. Is that a better form or just helter-skelter? Well, that's a, such an excellent uh, question and observation. Um, and it's certainly, in fact, I did a workshop kind of about some of that not long ago. Uh, 
and you're right, I think it's one of the concerns of many of us who care passionately about what we do in stories and all of that. Uh, debate with, in fact, you know, uh, we've all heard situations where newspapers inform their photographic staff, well, gee, we're going to let you go because we're going to outfit, in, in many cases, the writers all with cameras and we don't need you anymore. Uh, going beyond that, you know, maybe we don't need newspapers or TV stations as we traditionally have known them because this new form of communications, in many ways, people feel is more compelling. Uh, more immediate. Um, and, you know, there is a lot to be said about immediacy. But I tell you something, there's awful lot to say about the work of a great editor. A great editor's a great editor who understands the subject, understands the competing forces, not to mention understands their staff, knows how to push them to get the best out of them. And here I go again. And who can tell that staff member, you know, that's a piece of shit you just turned in. That's important. And as I say, I love immediacy more than anybody. Uh, not anybody, I'm sure the people that love it more than I do. But I mean, I think it's terribly exciting and important. But there needs to be fil there need to be filters. There need to be things, and it's not censorship, right? I mean, because there is that, and there, you know, there's the argument. Well, then, of course, it's the editor's story, and the editor is deciding, and so on, and so on, and so on. It, you know, and uh, <laughs> what happens about the subjectivity and all that? And I say, well, gee, you know, well, now wasn't there a person involved in the collection of this material at some point? And was there someone that was breathing? You know, I took their iPhone and made some simple decision about this moment versus that moment, and this moment is the one that you saw. Gee, that seems all like a little bit like something called subjectivity to me at some point. And so, by the very nature of the collection, there's been subjectivity somehow. I mean, it might be outrage that's driven it. It might be the need to further say something that's not been said. But it's subjective nonetheless. So when we debate that question, I think that's where we start, or should start. <laughs> but it's uh, something that is been so unfortunate when young people ask me, how do I get started, you know, I say to them, hey, gosh, I wish I could really fully tell you, you know, there's lots of ways and there's a lot more pictures being used, but if you want to make a car payment and stuff, get married maybe or do something else too, I'm not sure, you know, you need to collect some revenue, and I hate the dirty word of money, but, you know, when things just become all part of the, you know, everyday world, they have no value and there's no way to really make a living doing them. And I think that one of the wonderful things, certainly here in this country, that we've had is people that were good collectors. When I think back on Morrow, you know, and some of the great journalists who certainly preceded all of us, I'm glad they were there. I'm glad he went to World War II. Remember, he was an American, right? He made that decision. And uh, so I'm glad of that. I hope I've answered your question because it's such an important one. So there's still a place for Walter Cronkite. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think? Uh, hi. Um, hi. Uh, uh, I know um, Charlotte. My name is you Catherine take more Page. Her? Yeah, no, yeah, my name is Catherine Page, and oh, uh, yes, hi, hi, Annie. Well, and you know it's and your sister, sister Anna. I'm in her gallery, you know. I know you are, and that was a pivotal. That's how some of this started, by the way. Yes, you do well, know that. Well, well, in terms of my meeting, then yes, I, don't know. I know. 
I know, and this all all started and and just has become this extraordinary thing because for my forty uh, fifth reunion, and at that time Charlotte was still alive, and um, there was a photography small photography show here at the Davis, and your dad was represented in Gordon Parks and all sorts of other wonderful <laughs> photojournalists, and I got in touch with. The then director of the Davis, and I said, um, I, you know, there are no, oh, Dorothea Lang was in, the only female, and I said, um, I don't think that the Davis has any photographs by Charlotte Brooks, this <coughs> pioneer female photojournalist, and I, you know, would like to give one of her photographs as a reunion gift. Well, very soon, um, and Eliana, you just have got to take a big bow for all of what you have She's done. Wonderful. It became not just one, but 16. Um, and this extraordinary show. Uh, I had the pleasure of bringing a young woman prospective student on Sunday, walking around and looking at it and just being completely overwhelmed by it. But here is my question. <laughs> uh, okay, I think, Annie, I think Artie got to, to more to pick the stories he wanted, although I'm sure a lot were assigned. Who was the boss? Uh, yeah, but you know they you know, they gave him different places and different people to photograph. With Charlotte, of course, as a as a woman, she was, and the catalog goes into this um, that that she they weren't puff peaches, but they were kind of what they would have thought the, a female. Photographers right. should be taking. I think the or um, they were or they were stories that they didn't want to cover. Or they didn't want to cover. Yes. Yeah, it exactly. Yeah. It, it is, and um, and she did, you know, kind of uh, work out to do the stories that she did want to do, but um, and also to yeah. turn those stories, like the incredibly moving one. Just they were. The, those they pictures are, upstairs are are so that the story of the working woman, the way the way she. Her, her child hugging her, not wanting to let go. Oh, that the gay couple. Yep. Oh my God! You just, your heart just leaps when you look at those photographs. Yeah. And I can't imagine anyone else doing, no, I don't a job that. like that.